Okay, we're going to introduce our keynote speaker this morning. It's Pastor Eric Ludi, and he is the best-selling author of over 20 books with well over a million copies in print, including Wrestling Prayer, The Bravehearted Gospel, and When God Writes Your Love Story. He is the senior pastor of the church at Ellerslie and the lead instructor at Ellerslie Discipleship Training, a biblical training center in Colorado that draws students of all ages from all over the world. His weekly sermons are heard by tens of thousands of people across the globe, and his short films on the Christian life have been viewed by millions. His messages present a powerful wake-up call for the modern church, challenging believers to return to the triumphant, Bible-centered, Christ-empowered Christianity. Eric and his wife, Leslie, have been married over 20 years and live in Colorado with their six exuberant children. You can visit Eric at www.bravehearted.christian.com. Let's give him a warm welcome. Well, good morning to everyone. Is this thing on? You guys hear me all right? Great. So I need to strategize how I keep track of time. Yes, I will do use that. Uh, so... I've had a great time already. I've loved being in, I'm learning to say Len, Lancaster, Len, Lancaster. Uh, something about my Colorado attendancies says it wrong, uh, but uh, it's really neat being in your backyard. And uh, I'm very passionate about Jesus Christ. I'm sure that that's going to ebb forth uh, today. Uh, sometimes my volumes will swell because I get so excited, but uh, just know uh, it's just pure excitement for the person of Jesus Christ. So one of my desires is that you would be stirred in this time. If I'm going to come all the way out here, I hope that there's some flame that is caught and passed and transferred. So uh, I'm, I usually am using my notes are going to be up on the screen, so we'll see how well I can do this. Uh, but let's get going uh, simply because I know we're a little tight on time. Uh, let's see. Is this the... We're trying to get the clicker set here. I'll try it. You, is it time for me to try? Still not working? Do you want to forward it for me? There's my first slide, just to give you an idea. Uh, oh, that, that's just an idea. I don't want you to uh, <laughs> take it in too deeply. So, uh, but I have uh, six little kiddo pies. I have a, an amazing wife. Her name is Leslie. And uh, my oldest, you'll see, is Hudson, and so in the Dads and Donuts time, I'm going to be talking about, uh, I have a seven-stage uh, training for Hudson to go from boy to man, and I'm going to share the first installment of that with you guys, but that's been a very, very significant process I've been going through in my family. I have four adopted, if, if you're trying to figure out the dynamics of that, but that's, uh, that's, that's my life in a nutshell right there. Uh, the clicker's not working for some reason, Chris, so why don't you just press it forward? I'll just tell you when. The name of this is Fearless, and uh, I just, I really like words. I'm a, I'm a word guy, and the word fearless stirs me. I don't know what it is about it, but it's just like, yeah, that's the way I want to be. And yet, I think most of us would probably agree, we'd all love to be that, but uh, that's wishful thinking. And yet, when you study scripture, you're going to realize it's not wishful thinking, it's Christianity. And that's quite a statement, I know, living in a culture where most of the Christians are controlled by anxiety and fear. To actually make such an audacious statement is to say, no, this is actually supposed to be normal for us. Fearlessness is supposed to mark us. I think it was Richard Wormbrandt that used the statement that there are 366 uh, references to being fearless in the scriptures. And he memorized each of them because he was living in, first of all, Nazi control and then under the communist control under Stalin. Could you imagine being under Hitler and then under Stalin? It makes sense, and especially being a Jew. And so he learned all of 366, so he had one for leap year, and he was arrested on leap year, and he was very glad there was 366. But let's uh, press forward, Chris. You must. There is this idea and this bait into our soul that says you must give way to fear. There's, it's just either we have a, a reasoned as a personality thing, as you said, well, I'm just an anxious person, or it's like the circumstances demand it. Sure, we recognize what Scripture says, but this is special. This deserves a little anxiety. All right, next slide. Uh, I'm going to move down here. Sorry, guys. I'm going to at least try this. Uh, you must give way to anxiety. This is one of the you musts, okay? Now, it's totally preposterous, but I want you to recognize where this voice comes from. This doesn't come from God. 
You must give way to anxiety. You cannot possibly avoid the overwhelming flood of fretful imaginations. You must crumple into the fetal position and give way to the paralysis of fear. You cannot possibly be the hero. You are nothing. You are a coward and nothing more. Stay down, stay put, and stay afraid. Recognize that voice? That doesn't come from God. And so the moment you begin to tag a voice as not being from God, it only eliminates the main uh, possibilities and gets it down to one. In other words, this is from the devil. This is his, his entire theater of work is in the arena of fear and anxiety. If he can get you fearful, he has a grip. If you stay calm, he doesn't. Okay, next slide. Grabbing a hold of the banister. When I started out yesterday, I gave three messages yesterday, and this is one of the illustrations I gave, so this is a review for some of you. But when I was uh, at a certain developmental age, you ever had it where you read the New Testament and you see this life you're supposed to be living and you have no clue how you could possibly live it? Because you're digging down in your own pockets attempting to do it. And that's how most of us try and live out our Christianity. It's in our own pockets. And so as a result, the key in Christianity is learning how to transfer from reaching into our own pockets, in a sense, into God's pocket. In other words, what does he have for us? What has he supplied for us? So I remember I was at a crucial development stage where I was crying out to God saying, God, I'm sick and tired of the cyclical pattern of sin that I'm in. I recognize the high standard that I'm called to, but I don't know how to live it. So here's the situation. It's the middle of the night, and I wake up, and there's something beckoning me. Okay, you can fill in the gaps in your life of what that something could be. For me, I don't even remember what the situation was down in the basement, and I'm really glad I don't, so I don't have to go into any detail here. However, there's something that's pulling me out of bed in the middle of the night, and it's one of those things that every time it calls, I end up saying yes, even though I don't want to. And I'm always upset with myself, going, why did I do that? And so there I am, I'm at the top of the stairs, and there's a banister. And this time, was the, the one difference in it is I was crying out to God, saying, God, I don't want to go down there. I am so tired of living in this pattern of defeat. I want a different pattern, but I don't know how to get it. So this is called grabbing a hold of the banister. That's exactly what I did. I grabbed the banister and I said, God, I know you have something for me. I don't know what it's called and I don't know how it works, but I'm not moving from here until I get it. And guess what? I stood there for about an hour. And I went back to bed. I found something that night. It was a breakthrough in my spiritual development because even though the modern church didn't know how to instruct me in how to live this and, and how to get from God what he intends to have in us, living through us, I found something, and it changed my life. There's a different strength that began to ebb forth because from that point, it's like, I know God has something for me. Now I know it's called grace. But back then, grace was just a hug, so I didn't understand it in my mind, it was. In other words, it's like, oh, we're in the mud, and God hugs us in the mud, as opposed to recognize God's grace is that which enables us to do. It's the working of God in us to accomplish what he's commissioning us to do. Okay, the next slide. Disaster is lurking just around the corner. Look, I put quotes on that. It is a famous quotation. Just around the corner. You might be at peace now, but just around the corner, something terrible is going to happen. This is the basis of anxiety. The basis of fear is the unknown. It's, It's what's coming up that we can't control. Okay, the next slide. You will have an accident. You will catch a fatal disease. That this thing that happened to them will happen to you. Now, what's funny is this stuff doesn't work on me, okay? I, this is like Leslie, when she talks about the things that she struggles with, she's always like, she hears about someone that has cancer and then she feels like weak. And she's like, I wonder if I have the same thing. It's weird. And so it's like this transferring thing where the devil starts whispering, yeah, you too, yeah, you'll get that. Too. And like I look at this, I'm always looking at Leslie, like, that is ridiculous. It's like that's the equivalent of me looking at that clock on the wall and saying, oh, no, the clock may fly across the room and hit me in the face. And she looks like, it's different than that. (laughs) And yet, my struggles are financial. That's what it always was for me. So Leslie's were health and mine were finances. I looked at hers as ridiculous. She looked at mine as rather ridiculous. It's like, what, you don't think God can provide for us? Like, you don't think God can protect you from that sickness? In other words, we have our vulnerabilities, and the devil studies us. He knows where the access points are. This thing that happened to them will happen to you. That discomfort you feel in your body is something very serious. Okay, next slide. That spot on your body is the first sign of a fatal disease. Well, actually, someone was holding out a Sharpie, and you bumped into them. 
If you don't do something and do it now, it will be too late. Run for your life. Give sway to panic, fear, dread, and trepidation. Okay, now this is classic enemy. If you study the book of Nehemiah, it is so interesting because it breaks it down in what we could call nine lies. Nine key attempts of Sanballat, Tobias, and Geshem the Arabian to bring fear into the life of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a great study if you struggle with fear because what you realize is the same nine lies that, that Sanballat, Tobias, and Geshem the Arabian had for, for, I'm sorry, for Nehemiah is the same nine lies he has for us. There's nothing new under the sun. Same devil, same tactics. And when you begin to expose his tactics in your life, it's like, that's the devil. It actually helps. It really does. All right, next slide. Nehemiah 6.11. So one of the great baits of Nehemiah at, at this crucial point in development of the wall, which, by the way, my next, well, I have, after Dads and Donuts, I have a message called Fortification, which is on building a wall around your life. And so in this one, we have a, a prophet that is hired by Sanballat to come. And so he should be trusted, right? He's a prophet. And he comes to Nehemiah and says, they're coming for you, a great army. You need to go and flee with me into the temple and hide. Okay, now, when you were baited with that, what is your response? I mean, I just want you to process that. Look at Nehemiah's response. This is fantastic. And I said, says Nehemiah, should such a man as I flee? And who is there? that being as I am would go into the temple to save his life. I will not go in. It's like, oh, no, good job, Nehemiah. <laughs> Should such a man as Eric Ludi flee when the devil comes in and threatens? I'm a Christian. What about you? Do you have the stuff? Do you understand what it means to follow Christ? Do you understand that he is your shelter? He is your strong tower, your fortress. Should such a one as you, a Christian, flee? Next slide. The fearless legends of yesteryear. I love studying Christian biography, okay? That's one of my favorite things. Leslie, since we were first married, one of the, the pieces of advice that Leslie's parents gave to us is, what you want to do, Eric and Leslie, is grow together spiritually. And so read the same books. Go to the same conferences. Don't just have Eric go over here and get all strong and then come back and try and uh, do something to get you uh, all... You know, excited about Christianity, go together. Learn these things together. It's a very unique piece of uh, counsel in the very beginning. We've been married 25 years in December, and I'd still say that's one of the most incredible pieces of, of information that was ever passed to us as far as counsel. And so what we started doing is we started reading the same books together. We have this, uh, I don't know, it's a, it's a cycle of maybe 50 to 60 uh, books, most of them Christian biographies, and we go through them, and we go through them again, and we go through them again, and we go through them again. And we've grown up together, basically spiritually, studying these lives, okay? And so fearlessness is one of the things that always stands out to me amongst all these great Christians. Let's go through just a few. Hudson Taylor, my first uh, you know, born son is called Hudson, so obviously that shows you my esteem for this man. So Hudson Taylor is in England. He's studied to be a doctor and so, so he can go on the mission field to China. He knows he is called to China. And uh, back in this is the days of the bubonic plague. What a, day, what a time to be a doctor. And so they had all sorts of cadavers to work on. I won't go into what a cadaver is if you just don't happen to know. Uh, and so there's all sorts of cadavers there, but they had the, the plague. Most of them died from the plague. And so there was rule of thumb. Do not do any type of uh, work as, as a doctor, as a physician, unless, uh, if you have any cut, okay? Make sure you do not have any open wounds. Well, Hudson Taylor had had a paper cut the night before and he had forgotten about it. So he comes in that next day and is working on a cadaver that died of the plague. The next thing you know, he's feeling extremely weak and his uh, medical lead comes up to him and looks at him and says, you got it. Go home, prepare your things and prepare to die. That was literally how cool everyone was towards uh, death. I mean, there was so much death in England at the time that it's just like, yeah, you got it too, go die. And so Hudson Taylor is told to go home, prepare his things, and die. And I mean, once you get the plague, hey guys, it's just over, okay? I mean, what else is there to do? And so he goes back home, but doesn't prepare his things. He doesn't tell his family. And he's in this little uh, flat all by himself, laying on his bed, and he's feeling really bad. And yet he has a conversation with God. This is a great movie moment. I mean, if you could turn this into a movie. He looks up at the ceiling, and he's, you know, he's talking to God. He says, God... I am called to China. I know I can't die of the plague. This is his logic. And so this is what he does. He takes his two feet, 
He swings them out of the bed and thunk, thunk, stands on the floor, feeling all the effects of the plague, but stands up. He says, I am called to China. And he begins to move. And he begins to walk. And the story of Hudson Taylor follows. He changed the world. What a story. How many of you would not have a little anxiety and fear and trepidation over the plague? I mean, that's extraordinary. Okay, the next slide. Reese Howells. I love the story. Reese Howells' Intercessor. What a book. Uh, So Reese Howells is down in uh, Africa as a missionary. And uh, the the plague hits Africa. I have a whole bunch of plague stories, obviously. (laughs) The plague hits Africa, and people are dying everywhere. And the witch doctors can do nothing to stop this plague, right? I mean, it's just so no, everyone is powerless except Jesus Christ. And C.T., or C.T. Stead, uh, Reese Howes, C.T. Stead's one of my favorites. Uh, Reese Howes knows that this is an opportunity to make a statement for the power of Jesus Christ in Africa. And so what he says is, anyone that comes onto this compound, which is a fenced-in area, will not die of the plague, This is what he felt God gave him to say to the people of Africa. Could you imagine how audacious that was? Could you imagine working for Reese going, no, (laughs) you may not want to say that. What if someone dies? He says, anyone that comes onto this compound will not die. So not one person will die from the plague who finds shelter on our land. So there were literally witch doctors that were crawling to get onto the property and not one person that crossed that property line, even if they had the plague, did not die. Okay. Could you imagine standing like that in the midst of the plague with such audacity and confidence? Next slide. C.T. Studd. Oh, see, we did have a C.T. Studd in here. C.T. Studd, oh, one of the greatest missionaries of all time. Just look at his name. His name was Charles Thomas. So Charles means manly. So manly Studd (laughs) was his name. I mean, that is the greatest name. I get stuck with Ludi, and he got Studd. And I had a Japanese foreign exchange student at uh, my college that I was at, and she, I said my name, Eric Ludi, and we were shaking hands, and she chuckled, and I go, what's so funny? She goes, in Japan, Ludi me nerd. <laughs> Great. So C.T. Studd goes over to, uh, to China under Hudson Taylor's ministry, and I mean, he's living in interior China. His body is broken down. He was a star athlete. He would have been like the... LeBron James, he would have been like, uh, I'm trying to think of a great athlete now. I always think of like, I used to say John Elway. (laughs) I'm way dated in my athletes now. But he was the athlete of his day. And he got all these diseases over in China. His body worked through him. Then he went to interior India, had all sorts of diseases. By the time he was like 54, he was basically a dead man walking. Great athlete, you know, an incredible stud of a man is now just a uh, fading uh, light and he's laying on his deathbed basically uh, and he's, he's dying from all of this ravaging of his body because he had poured out his life for Jesus Christ. I mean, the effects of his life are so transcendent through nations. I mean, he's just an incredible missionary. And he hears that David Livingston comes back from Africa and, and basically communicates that there are, there's a whole, in interior Africa, there are people that have never once heard the gospel. There is no one who has ever gone to interior Africa to share the gospel. Now, there was a problem with going to interior Africa, and that was that if you were of white skin, you could not survive. The diseases would ravage you, and usually you could only last around seven to 10 days. So there was a gold rush there, and so men would risk their life to go and get gold there, but most of them would die because of it. But missionaries, I mean, you gotta be crazy to go into interior Africa. So he's lying on his deathbed, He raises his hand to heaven and says, God, send me. Don't send one of those young bucks. Send me. Uh, CT, you do know that you're almost dead. And you do know that no one can survive in interior Africa. Send me, Lord. He goes and tries to pass a physical. They reject him from the missionary societies. He's, He's dead, basically. You can't go, CT. There's no way you could do this. So he says, I'm going, and I have a missionary society of one. His name is God. He's sending me. So he travels literally from England to Congo, and he's in the Congo, and he doesn't die. He lives there 20 years. How did he do it? He'd already had all the diseases. This guy was fearless. It's extraordinary. Okay, next one. Amy Carmichael, knowing all the risks, I'm going. She was sickly, one of the greatest missionaries of all time. She was sickly. She is told that if you go there, you will die. Knowing all the risks, I'm going. Okay, you want a little piece of that in your soul? Yeah, so do I. That's good stuff. Next slide. 
Gladys Aylward. Oh, this is a good story. Okay, so Gladys Aylward is in the Siberian region. She's on her way to China, and the train runs out of track. I mean, this is like, what's going on? There's a war, a Japanese-Chinese war. And so as a result, she's stuck in Siberia. I mean, this is a really bad situation. And so she's, she's put in a hotel, uh, and so she's, she's by herself in this hotel, and the master of the hotel, the guy who owns it, decides, hey, he has a pretty young thing in his hotel, and he has the master key, and there's no one to protect her, so he literally opens up her door and walks in to take advantage of her. Okay, that's a difficult moment. How are you ladies doing right now in such a circumstance? Well, look how Gladys handles the situation. Stop right there. Uh, and the man says, hey, I can do what I want. This is my hotel, and you're in it. I'm God here. And she goes, I serve the God of the universe, Jesus Christ, and he is my protector. There is a barrier between you and me. Take one more step forward and find out. Uh, okay, that's good. Do we think that way? Do we live that way? Or do we cower in fear? There is something very special that Christians of old have walked in, and we need a little piece of it, guys. Okay, the next slide. We read of a stag that roamed about in the greatest security by reason of its having a label on its neck. Touch me not, I belong to Caesar. Thus the true servants of God are always safe, even among lions, bears, serpents, fire, water, thunder, and tempest, for all the creatures know and reverence the shadow of God. Oh, that's good. Next slide. Touch me not, I belong to Jesus. I mean, Caesar, I mean, if, you wouldn't touch a stag because it belongs to Caesar. Do you imagine all the powers of darkness when they see the sign around our neck? Hey, I belong to Jesus. All right, the next slide. Eric Ludi's stress disorder. Boy, this feels like we're going in the wrong direction, doesn't it? So the guy standing in front of you is very familiar with anxiety. I didn't like calling it that. It sounded bad. But I had a problem with anxiety. And I didn't realize that until I got into ministry. Ministry is really what stirred it all up. You see, I, I was fine. I was a very happy young guy. But then once I took a front lines position, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. And I was hit, and I was hit hard. The devil wanted to take me out right in the very beginning, and he did a pretty good job of it, guys. And I, I remember uh, one time I sat down with Leslie's family. We were just getting hit, mauled. Every time we'd travel, Leslie was sick. I mean, our finances, we would, people hating us and wanting us dead. It's like, what are we, all we're doing is trying to love people. And I remember telling Leslie's parents, I said, we're, we're done. We're done, we can't do this. Uh, and I feel like, this is, literally, I had a conversation with the devil. I know it sounds terrible, but he, he said, give it up, Eric, and I'll let you go. So I said, yeah, I, I just feel like, you know, he said, if we just give this up, he's gonna stop harassing us. He's gonna stop messing with us. And Leslie's mom looks at me and she goes, he's lying to you. He will not stop messing with you until you're dead. You know too much, Eric. I was sitting at the time and I stood up. I'm not stopping. That's what, that was a key moment in my life. I mean, this is scary for me. I didn't know what it meant to be protected by Jesus Christ. I didn't know what it meant to have authority in Christ's name. I had no clue what I was doing. I was just sitting there getting mauled by the enemy. And yet, that day I stood up recognizing that he's a liar. He's a liar. He wants me to stop, and he's going to give me a false bargain. No, I'm with Jesus. But at this time, it didn't stop me from having some serious stress. I, my body was breaking down. I, I remember one moment in Chicago traffic where I could feel my hair turning white. I mean, just literally. <laughs> and I mean, I did not know how to handle these situations. When circumstances would turn, I would literally feel the weight crushing on my soul. Remember times, you know, that pa brown paper bag thing? Was like, <laughs> yeah, okay. Now, Leslie was the one that knew what was going on. Most people in the public eye, when we started traveling and speaking, didn't know what was going on. There were times I would be in the back room in the green room, paralyzed on the floor. I remember where it started, too. We were packing up our stuff to travel from Michigan to Colorado, and I had, had packed my stuff in various locations and so it was really stressful because I like to pack right. You know, you stick the heavy things on the bottom and the light china, or the, it's not light, but the china on top. And you, you do it properly, right? Well, I had 
it all mixed up in these various locations because we didn't have enough room to store our stuff in Michigan. So we had this guy's barn, this guy's attic, this guy's basement. And so my stuff was just stacked wrong and uh, it was stressful. The whole day was miserable. And I remember finally closing the Ryder truck and closing the lock, which cost like $10. Couldn't believe the lock cost $10. And I, I mean, I'm hardly enough money to get back to Colorado. And I remember I walked, I was so exhausted that day. I was not handling any of this well, by the way. If you're wondering if that's the pattern and that's the model, that's not. And I went into the house after packing full the Ryder truck. And I remember if it was a camera in a movie, it would be like, zoomed through to the back window of, of our apartment. And what did I see? Our grill. I had forgotten to pack our grill. And I, it's like the devil came in and, you know, with a steak dinner called anxiety. He says, you deserve it. And he even had a fork and knife ready for me. He's like, you deserve it. And I made a bargain that day. I dug into that thing and started chewing. And my body went into a paralysis mode. I literally was paralyzed. I was lying on the floor going. <laughs> and Lester comes in, oh, are you all right? I mean, it's pathetic. It was pathetic. And I could not change it. From that point forward, whenever something extreme would happen, I would be down on the floor. I was paralyzed. So, so much for the manly leader, Eric Ludy. This is what was going on in my life. I remember actually going with these pastors to this movie about the, the Bay of Pigs and the Cuban Missile Crisis. It's like, why did I do that? Uh, and Bobby Kennedy and John F. Kennedy are trying to make a decision that could count, you know, cost two million lives, you know, if they make the wrong decision. And I was sitting in the crowd and realizing it's not just my issues now, it's, a, you know, an actor's issues that are now burdening me. It's like, this is pathetic. And I remember reading a, a, a book and it said, uh, you know, Elizabeth Elliot in Passion and Purity said, God took me through a season of teaching me tensile strength. And I go, whatever that is, I need it. But I didn't have it. And I remember I was out in uh, Pennsylvania. Actually, I, I was. I flew into Pittsburgh Airport. I was out in Pennsylvania speaking at an event. And something went terribly wrong in the event. It was so stressful. We didn't have a sound system. And something extreme was happening. And that night I was in a bed and breakfast and this little undersized bed with Leslie, you know, the type of thing where you move a little and everyone goes, here, here, here. And so, you know, I'm like this, but I couldn't breathe that night. I was like, and I didn't want to wake her up. And I also don't want Leslie to overreact. Okay. That's a key thing as a man. You don't want them to really know what's going on because then they're going to go, oh, call 911. No, 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 we're not doing that. I'm not going to the hospital. Okay. I'm fine. And so I, I can't breathe. Have you ever had that? It's, oh, that's not fun. Right. I couldn't breathe. And I was so stressed out. It's like fear was gripping me, anxiety. It's like, how are we gonna make it financially? How are we gonna do this? How's this, even, this event gonna work? If we don't have a sound system, we're not gonna be able to even project. It's this huge auditorium. How's that gonna work? Oh. So, I mean, Eric's just misappropriating everything in this situation. That next day, I'm walking through the airport, and I have this extreme tightness and tension. I, I didn't have any strength in my left arm, and I had to set down my bag. I don't know why I was carrying my suitcase, but I had to set it down. Leslie goes, are you all right? I go, I'm fine, I'm fine. So let's keep going, let's keep going. I go two feet and I have to drop it. Okay, what's going on? Okay, it's not that big of a deal. I just have a sharp pain in my chest. I have no strength in my left arm. <laughs> so the next thing you know, Eric's in the hospital getting an EKG. And you know, I remember the diagnosis like, you have an extreme amount of stress in your life. You have a stress disorder. I didn't have a heart attack. I had a stress disorder. You know, one sounds dignified at least. At least Eric has a heart attack. People go, oh, poor guy. But having a stress disorder, come on. <laughs> so right now, I am 48 years old. That was when I was 28. I have zero anxiety in my life. The weights on my life are, this is not even an exaggeration, probably 1,000, 10,000 times heavier than what I was carrying back then. And yet I have no anxiety. What happened in my life? Well, let's walk through just a little of it. By the way, how are we doing time-wise? I, I want to be sensitive to that. Okay, I have 15 minutes. Rock beneath our feet. This is Leslie's in my secret right here. Because Leslie's had extreme anxiety in her life. I've had extreme anxiety in my life. We set forth to change the world for Jesus, and the devil knocked us down hard. However, this is what we'll always say. Let's get some rock beneath our feet. Whenever we start to feel wobbly, whenever the devil's hitting us with something new, it's like we need rock beneath our feet. What does that mean? We need scripture. We need to know what God says on the issue so we can stand on it. The devil can't push us when we stand firmly on that rock. So let's get some rock beneath our feet. Okay, Chris. 
So listen, I'll get you, give you some rock right now, okay? The Lord is their light and their salvation, so whom shall they fear? The Lord is the strength of their life, so of whom shall they be afraid? Good question. Though a host should encamp against them, their heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against them, they remain confident in their God. Next slide. Because God will never leave them or forsake them, and he ever lives to make intercession for them. God is their refuge and strength, the very present help in their trouble. Therefore, they will not fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Next slide. And no weapon that is formed against them shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against them in judgment God shall condemn. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Oh, could you imagine living with that gusto in your soul? Next slide. Believing the record. It's, a, it's an interesting phrase used in Scripture, specifically by the Apostle John. He uses the term record. Now, some of us would understand it as witness, but John is going to use it in the translation that we oftentimes get as record. But it's the same word as witness. It's martyria. It's the word where we get martyr from. Believing the record. Okay, the next slide. And he that saw it bear record. This is John speaking at the cross. He has just seen the fact that Jesus' legs were not broken and instead his side was pierced. And he gets so excited about it. Why? Because it's a fulfillment of prophecy. If even one bone is broken in, in that Messiah's body, in that paschal lamb, it's not the Messiah. And so, but every leg would be broken in a true crucifixion. But not this one. He's saying, I saw it, guys. They actually didn't break his legs. Not one bone of his body was broken. And in fact, he fulfilled scripture because he had to be pierced. That's extraordinary. So that's why he's so excited here. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knows that he saith true. Why? That you might believe. You see, the key is a record is given. Jesus says, I tell you beforehand what I am going to do, what is going to happen, so that when it does happen, you would believe. You see, the reason God has given us the record is so that we can believe. And when we believe, we are unstoppable. Okay, next slide. He that believes not God has made him a liar. I oh, don't want to do that. Because he believes not the record that God gave of his son. So God gives a record. But if you don't believe God, you're calling him a liar. Fear, when we function in fear, is the equivalent of calling God a liar, guys. We're saying, I don't believe God can take care of this situation. You see, anxiety makes no logical sense in the kingdom of heaven. If you really do believe that God is who he says he is, then you should handle that situation very differently. All right, next slide. Therefore, we will not fear. See, a therefore is announcing something. It's announcing that there's something before it, right? So if I just said, okay, I'm going to give you a great scripture. Therefore, we will not fear. You would say, uh, could you tell me what's before that? Because there's something that has been dropped by the writer that caused this conclusion to come out. Okay, let's, let's look at it. The preposterous statement. Let's, let's, you can keep going to the next slide. Therefore, we will not fear. Now, this is obviously starting mid-flow of thought. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. You cannot think of a more extreme circumstance than that. I mean, I'm sure you could use your imagination, but look at this. Though the, mountain, though the earth be removed, okay? Could you imagine the earth is like, you know, earthquake, falling to pieces, lava's gurgling? Or imagine this grand wind is also blowing and everything's just being carried away. Mountains are being thrown into the midst of the sea. Now, I live in Colorado, so that means maybe a little more to me than it does to you guys in Pennsylvania. But the point is, these, this is massive destruction. All is breaking loose. The world is ending. I will not fear. What do you mean you won't fear? How could you not fear in that situation? Well, there's something that is said right before this that literally causes this conclusion. And because of this, therefore, I will not fear in the most extraordinary of circumstances. Aren't you excited to see what it is? Now, some of you may know. You're like, you know, taxing your brain going, what was it? What was it? I actually read it earlier, but, you, you, but you, well, let's get to it now. This is so exciting, guys. The promise behind the preposterous statement, you see, the, it's not just the statement, do not fear, that matters to us. It's the promise that we build on. You see, when God speaks, don't call him a liar. Believe the record. You see, he has spoken and he cannot lie. 
And when God speaks, you can take it to the bank. You can build your life upon it and be unshakable. All right, what is that promise? God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Guys, there it is. I mean, build your life there. God is our refuge. You know what I say to our students at Ellers? I I, I run a, a training school in Windsor, Colorado. And I'll say, what's your position? And they'll yell back, in Christ. You need to know your position. God is our refuge and strength. Do you fear the coming judgment? No. Why? Because I'm in Christ. You see, Christ is my righteousness. It's not up to me to live perfectly. He lived perfectly, and I find my refuge inside of his shed blood, his work. Well, that's how we live down here on this earth, too. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Next slide. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, will not we fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea? Next slide. Okay, let's do it again, guys. The preposterous statement. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. There we have another so, therefore. There's something before this that is causing uh, the writer of Hebrews to say that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. So what was said before the soul? Aren't you excited? All right, let's look. The promise behind the preposterous statement. All right, next slide. He hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That's your rock, guys. Stand on it. This is where we build our house as Christians. We build our house on the promises of God, exceeding great and precious ones. And when we believe the record, we are stout of soul. We are fearless. All right, next slide. He hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. All right, what's the next slide? Tensile toughness. Remember how I said I was going through this season, and I read this little line, and it said, God took me through a season of training me in tensile strength. Tensile strength? I remember thinking, what is tensile strength? It's not muscular strength. It's soul strength. Now, the way that we would understand it in a practical sense is like it's the measurement of rope. It's the measurement of springs on a trampoline. And so it's basically how much weight something can handle and for how much time. It's like how much difficulty can that rope handle before it snaps? How much difficulty can those springs handle? How much weight can it handle before they break? Okay, and of course, if you're jumping on a trampoline, you want to know that it's very strong, right? The same is true with the soul of a Christian. You see, the soul of a Christian is supposed to be built to handle difficulty without snapping. Tensile strength. Now, this is different than tinsel. Tinsel is what you hang, that silver stuff you hang on your Christmas tree. Okay, that's not what we're talking about here. This is stuff, tough stuff. That's weak stuff. Okay, so that's why it's awkward when you first hear it. Tensile toughness, built to go through anything fearlessly. So I began to pray that God would build up tensile strength in me. I was a mouse, is what I was. The smallest little pebble would come on my shoulder and I would collapse. I was like, okay, this is unacceptable. God, if you're calling me to lead, I need to be able to be strong in my soul. Not muscularly, I went to the gym all the time. I know, you can tell. I I, I know, it's obvious. (laughs) But I needed soul strength. I needed the stuff within that when the weights of this world came on, I could hold them. You see, when my little children are trying to carry my weights, it, it, it crushes them. But I have daddy strength. So it's like, I'll carry that for you guys. I can carry all the groceries in. You ever done that as a guy where you have all the groceries and you like literally putting your hands through all the plastic bags and you're walking like this because you have, you know, some milk here on your knee as you're going. (laughs) In other words, we are built as Christians to carry great weights without collapsing and even complaining. I went through a season in my life of tensile strength training. I'm still in it, but it was a heightened season. And I decided I I was going to start with the small things in my life and not complain about them, but rejoice in them. So my alarm goes off in the morning, early. And it usually, you know, I can't stand my alarm. You know, it's like your arch nemesis is your alarm. And that sound that we used to have before we had all these cool alarms nowadays, it used to be dee 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 Oh, I hated that sound. And so I would just go, you know, sort of karate chop it. And then I began, I decided, you know what, I'm going to be a friend with this alarm. Thank you, alarm. And I was like, tensile strength, tensile strength, tensile strength. And I'd get out of bed and I'd do a little dance. Tensile strength, it's a new day. I, I, Leslie was pregnant with Hudson. I remember practicing tensile strength. 
And women get weird during pregnancy. <laughs> Leslie, in the middle of the night, wanted cereal, okay? All right. And so I pop awake. You know, I like my sleep, and I like my sleep to be uninterrupted. But pregnancy really messed with that. And so I hopped out of bed, and I was like, tensile strength, tensile strength, tensile strength, tensile strength, tensile strength, tensile strength. So I'm in my boxers going down the stairs, tensile strength, tensile strength. I go into the kitchen, pour some cereal, tensile strength, tensile strength, tensile strength, tensile strength. I mean, every step forward, I'm getting stronger, guys. In other words, as I appropriate a difficulty, now some of you are like, that's your difficulty? That's where I started practicing because I wasn't handling the big stuff at all. I wanted to handle the small stuff well. So I get all the way up, give her her cereal. I'm like, that worked. This is great. I go to bed. About, oh, a minute later, Lessa goes, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, could you get me some water? Tensile strength. Tensile strength, tensile strength, tensile strength, tensile strength. All right, next slide. The first turn. Where do you turn when that crisis of soul hits you? What are you turning to? It cannot be to anything but God. The secret to living fearlessly is you have to know that he is your refuge and your strength, the very present help in time of trouble, that he will never leave you nor forsake you. You always have to turn to the word of God first. That is the great secret of the Christian. All right, next slide. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. You hang out there, guys. You abide in that presence, and I tell you what, though a thousand fall at your side, though 10,000 at your right hand, it shall not come near you. Next slide. There is a faith whereby a man does betake himself unto God for shelter, for protection as to his habitation. When other men do run on, on this, one this way, another that way to their hiding places in the time of plague for a man, then to betake himself to God as to his habitation. I think this is the faith here spoken of in the 91st Psalm. Next slide, Chris. Grabbing a hold of the banister. For each of you in here, you may look at, you know, hear a message like this and it sounds pie in the sky. I don't know how you're appropriate. For me, it's very real. Like I said, I'm 48 years old. I have crushing weights in my life. Most people would be crushed by what I carry. I have been falsely accused so many times publicly. And I tell you, just one time can crush someone. I have had so many, I've, I've lived a George Mueller life for a good portion. I didn't choose it, guys. I run a college campus and we've had, oh, I don't know what it is, in the 40s of how many months we've been completing the month, one week out, and we don't have enough for payroll on the first of the next month. How many times, it's over 40 months that I've gone through that and I've seen God supernaturally provide. So at a certain point, you'd expect that Eric Lee would just be like, oh yeah, it's easy. Every month I have to start over. Every month I have to rise up to the faith that is re required. Every single trial, yes, maybe I start a little higher each time, I have no idea, but it's like, it's real labor called faith. And yet, the guy standing in front of you is the happiest guy you'll probably ever meet. And I mean that. I love serving Jesus. I am happy in my life. I don't want someone else's life. I receive the challenges that come my way because they don't harm me, they build me. I have a built-in free membership to the ultimate gym. It's called life on the front lines of Christian ministry. And if you appropriate that weight properly, it makes you stronger. If you just let it sit on your chest, you're like, oh, it's breaking my ribs. It'll probably break your ribs. You choose to engage the weights of life and turn them into greater strength. And guess what? You could be whispering tensile strength, tensile strength, tensile strength in every circumstance. You're dancing. You're leaping. This is why Christianity is called and defined the way it is. It's good stuff. All right, next slide. Oh, I forgot to even mention, grab a hold of the banister. That was the whole point of that slide. Grab a hold of that banister. If you're wondering, can you get this? Grab a hold until you do, guys. Don't let go. We are giving one free week of our training, which is, by the way, extraordinary training. Uh, it is magnificent uh, what takes place in people's lives to take a, a season of your life and focus only on Jesus Christ is pretty amazing. And so we have a one-week version, we have a five-week version, then we have a 10-week version down in Windsor, Colorado. We're giving away one free week of Ellerslie Discipleship training for someone in here, and you could bring a guest, okay? And that's like a $3,500 value. So it's a good, good thing. We always love to do that at these conferences. All right, one more slide. I think it's just our, our booth, booth 517. I'm gonna be around today and I would love to pray with you. I'd love to encourage you in any way that I can to serve what God is doing inside of you. That's why I'm here. I'm more a pastor than I am anything else, okay? I love to encourage and give cheer to a soul. All right, let me pray for you. Father, I just ask 
that you would build strong your body. Those that are hungry for what is being presented here this morning, I pray that you would cultivate it in them, that they would grab a hold of you, grab a hold of that banister and not let go. Not let go until they see these next steps begin, begin to be formed in their life. Lord, that these patterns of anxiety would be broken over them. Lord Jesus, that you would establish your pattern of faith and strength in the word of God in them. Lord Jesus, we cherish your word, we cherish your truth, and we love you. Amen.